Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop, here at chess.com. And I've been teaching chess to beginners and intermediate players since 1984, helping them to achieve the next level. Now, one of the means by which we accomplish that task is by taking a look at their games and kind of uh, giving them a bit of a critique or an overview and an analysis to help improve from our mistakes. And so we've got a commissioned video today, commissioned by Professor Bruce Hedman, one of my students. Um, he's also a math teacher, uh, a professor at uh, UConn. So uh, he gave me this game, wanted me to analyze it and to make a video about it. And by the way, that's a service that is available to you as well. If you have a favorite game of your own or someone else's game, a master game, you can commission a video as well. Just contact me in the email below in the description and I'll be glad to do that for you. Okay, so this was a game um, <clears throat> where Bruce did uh, emerge victorious and there were some points where maybe a better move could have been played but um, a win is a win and it was quite a nice win in the end so let's uh, take a look at it we're going to start out with d4 by this was an online game but it was a rated tournament game just so you know <clears throat> d5 and Chitata here goes with queen d3 now queen d3 is known humorously as the Amazon attack, but it's not among the more preferable openings because you don't want to bring your queen out early. We have a little mantra that says, let your bishop and your knight lead in the fight. And uh, so it's better to uh, wake up your bishop and your knight. You don't want to obstruct pieces. Here, the bishop's favorite path is obstructed by the queen. And so we'd much rather see some moves like uh, Tsukertort's variation, which is actually the second most popular move, but I mention it first because it's one of Bruce Hedman's favorite um, openings when he plays D4. Uh, the most popular is actually C4, which is the queen's gambit. Uh, but of course, Bishop F4 is also a viable alternative, the third most common uh, move here. It's the accelerated London system. Uh, but uh, Queen D3, you will not see this played at um, advanced level chess. A knight to C6. Now the most popular move actually in this position is more of an advanced opening. Um, it's f5, <clears throat> and that transposes to the anti-stonewall variation of the Dutch defense. This is the Manhattan Gambit, which is very popular. And after pawn takes an h3, then uh, knight f6 or g3 all popular ideas but somewhat advanced so sticking with something very basic like developing your knight is uh, right in the ballpark now c3 um, is not found in the master level database uh, there is one game that was reached in a master game here where knight to f3 was played and that was in 2002 at the nordvest cup at bad Zwischenan. Uh, that's in germany and that was actually in a game between the grandmaster lev gutmann and siegfried weber uh, it is definitely the best move as it develops the knight and attacks the center of the board but uh, c3 here 
And e5, black strikes right at the center. And he now has the option of trading on d4 or pushing to e4 and attacking the queen. He's got some good initiative. So pawn takes pawn was played. Knight takes pawn. And queen e3. Now that's not a bad move because it pins the knight to the king. But it might be preferable to play queen to c2 so that your bishops are not blocked. The one drawback of this move is it blocks this pawn, the bishop can't get out, and this bishop is blocked. Nonetheless, the pressure on the knight is uh, possibly worth that blockage. And bishop d6 actually is a mistake by Bruce uh, because you've got to deal with the pin. And so black has defended his knight with bishop d6, but it does not address the threat uh, that white would like to play. Pawn to f4, attacking the knight, which cannot move because it's pinned, and therefore that knight would be lost in that scenario. So for that reason, um, queen e7 has to be played because now the threat of f4 is negated because the knight will be able to move away and no harm, no foul if he trades queens. So bishop d6 protects the knight for only a half of a move. Well, white did not exploit that. He does attack the pinned piece, which is good practice, but he should attack it with his pawn because that's going to win the knight outright. Black has no way to save the knight. Um, no matter what he does, the pawn will capture the knight. And again, you can't move the knight because that would be check, and you're not allowed to move into check. So a few early missteps by both sides, but now black breaks the pin with queen e7. H3, knight f6, and white played b3. He should try simply to trade here. Knight takes knight, bishop takes knight, and then continue to develop knight d2. After knight e4, the knights can be traded, and then the bishop can get out of bed. Uh, should be noted here that white could not take this pawn because the queen is undefended on e4 and black would be able to play check while discovering an attack against the queen and that would win the queen after the check is removed with pawn takes bishop. Bye bye queenie, it's been nice knowing you. Let's go back b3 and the point is to develop his bishop which is not a bad idea but you need to resolve some of the threats first normally development is the best first approach but when there are threats on the board sometimes you have to defer your development uh, to deal with those threats kingside castle and again Knight takes would be the better approach. He played bishop to b2, which was the purpose of pawn to b3. But again, if he trades the knights off first and then trades the queens, well, now bishop b2 is fine, and the game might continue with knight e4, pawn to e3, normal development with bishop f5, Pawn to g4, perhaps. And after bishop retreats, bishop to g2 is a good developmental move that puts pressure here. But really, black uh, is fine, and he can continue to improve his pieces. Let's go back. Bishop to b2 by white. 
knight to c6. Now, he's got a much stronger move than knight to c6. Um, and the move he should try is knight to e4. Why? Why is that so much stronger? Well, it threatens to play bishop to c5, which not only hits the queen, but it looks through to the queen at the pawn, which is already under attack by the knight. So, for example, if white were to continue by playing knight takes knight and bishop to c5, and then the queen moves out of the way of the attack after check, the king has to get out of check, and now black recaptures the knight, and black is dominating already on move number 12. Let's go back. So knight c6 is not a very aggressive uh, move. It's actually, frankly, somewhat passive. It does deal with the super attack, although that's not really much of an attack since it's adequately defended. And it does put the question to his opponent's queen, which is answered by a queen trade. Bishop takes queen and then e3. Now bishop e6, getting his last minor out of bed. Very good. He's got all minors out while white still has two minors standing in their bed. Now one, bishop d3. Pawn to a6, not real clear on the purpose of this move. Again, just keep um, improving your pieces. There's no need. He, If he wanted to move here, he would have done so here. So there's no need to prevent the bishop from coming here. Um, and the, the pawn doesn't really accomplish anything else. So... You know, get your get your rooks centralized, perhaps, or continue to attack in the center here since you have a development advantage, maybe a move like knight to e4. And we're not worried about being captured because when we recapture, we're doing so with tempo. And, you know, there, he's got a couple of choices. He could play to d4. He could play to d2. But the point is we're keeping active um, and keeping our opponent in a place where he has to make decisions. Knight to g5. And again, peace activity. Note the king. There is no queen, but look at everything that's defended. Look at everything that's undefended. All these are undefended targets. And we're really just one step away from putting one of those targets in danger. So knight e5 is a more active move. It attacks the undefended bishop. And then after the bishop moves, then sure, get your bishop out of danger. But let's play the active moves while they're available to us. Okay, bishop d7 right away in this example. h4 b5, b4. White needs to prevent black from playing his knight to e5. Black has had a couple of chances to do so. He hasn't done so, but that threat is looming, and so white should prevent it by playing his knight back to f3 so that knight e5 is impossible. b4, and sure enough, Knight e5 is played by black, and with this move, black is in good control here. Well done. Bishop to c2. Knight to c4, occupying another massive hole in white's defense. Now in white's territory, striking at the undefended bishop. It has to retreat back to bed. And from there, it has nowhere else to go at the moment. So he's been rendered fairly impotent. 
Pawn to c6. Not the most active move. Um, and really not necessarily any reason to play there. There's no attack. Your bishop might actually like to be there at some point. More active would be a move like a5, where you could open up the file for your rook. c6, a3, and knight d6. And again, keep playing active moves. Uh, this would definitely be a good time. If, if the previous turn was not a good time, this is definitely a good time to go for this pawn break. And if pawn takes pawn, rook takes pawn, and black has an enormous attack. He's got one, two, three pieces looking at a3. His other rook can come in and join the party on the next turn. This is just devastating. Let's go back. So knight d6. He's, he's sort of... Um, doing these quick little skirmishes and hit and retreat and hit and retreat kind of kind of jabbing in in boxing but not not coming through with any real strong uppercuts or roundhouses or or things like that f3 this is um white is terribly remiss in his development he's standing here with all of these pieces in bed. This knight has actually become so bored it started using the rook's hat as a dish for its oats. And he's over here gobbling up oats out of the rook's hat because he's so tired. He wants to get in the game. Uh, really, just get your pieces in the game, White, and um, get developed. Bishop f5. Uh, since white failed to play knight to d2, um, there's still this gaping void here at c4, and a knight would love to occupy that void. This makes for a very nice outpost for the knight. Bishop f5, though. Bishop takes bishop. Knight takes bishop, pawn to e4, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, renewing the threat against the knight, which he answered by playing to g3. Very nice. Rook to h3. And believe it or not, he doesn't have to be in a hurry to capture this. <clears throat> he did capture it. It's actually better to defend this knight with your bishop. Get your bishop more active. So the rook wouldn't dare take the knight. That pawn's not going anywhere. I mean, now especially, we just take it and renew the defense. Uh, so, it's a sitting duck at any time. Uh, if he tries to bring in another defender with knight d2, we kick away this defender with pawn h6. And when he retreats, we still don't gobble this up. We continue to um, build with a move like rook f e8. And again, this is an enormous attack against the the white's position uh, one thing you do not want to capture with with knight f takes e5 and certainly not the best course of action after knight takes knight and knight takes knight knight to d2 would be played and then the knight would have to retreat. And after knight b3, well, white still has fighting hopes. Note that rook to e3 is not the right way. It might look like white's getting a skewer here, but he's not because of the exposure of the king. Black could play bishop takes pawn check. 
And once the king gets out of check, again, we bring in our rook. And um, black is just dominating. Let's go back. Oops, went back a touch too far. He did play knight g, takes e4. And by the way, it's not a losing move. I should say that. Uh, but Lasker wisely said, when you find a good move, consider if there are any better moves. And yes, bishop d6 is definitely more active and better than knight takes the pawn. This is not a losing move, though. And frankly, there's no wrong way to win a chess game. Now, rook e3. And remember the exposure of the king in this, this pawn, which is now undefended. And so there is a tactic here that might be hard to see. Um, he played pawn, a knight takes a knight. But black could have played, again, this idea of rook f to e8, getting in line with the enemy king. And the point is, after knight takes knight and knight takes knight, white cannot dare capture this knight. And why? Because if he does, notice this peace relationship. Bam. That's check, but the rook cannot capture because it's pinned. <laughs> and so the king would have to move to get out of check, and then the rook is hanging. So let's back that up again. How do we see a move like this when it's our turn to play? We identify the king, the queen, if it's still on the board. In this case, it's not. And any undefended pieces. And we look for ways to attack those targets. And so what brings our, my, our eye to the move rook f to e8, or even rook a to e8, you could use either rook in this example, but the point being that we're setting up this entire sequence, we have to be able to visualize the absence of these two knights. And in visualizing that absence, we recognize this path is clear for the bishop with our rook in line with the king. And boy, isn't that glorious? Oh, you want to take my knight? Well, have fun losing your rook. Bada bing, bada boom. Might be a bit difficult at um, Bruce's level to spot something like that, but th that's the process by which we're more likely to spot it when we're identifying opponent targets, the peace relationships, the king, the queen, and anything that's undefended, and how can we get our attackers in line with those targets? Again, this is not a, a losing move. And so it's just as important not to lose as it is to win. <laughs> you know? There's no wrong way to win a chess game. Now, if he had taken the bishop here, um, the knight comes to e6, and the rook is almost trapped. These are under black's control, and the only safe square for that rook is the one it's on, and b7. So we have ideas of playing rook f to b8, controlling that square, followed by king to f8, which then attacks the trapped rook. That would be the plan, which is undoubtedly why white resisted rook takes bishop. So instead, pawn takes knight, which does put heat on this knight as well. 
Um, D5, what a move. Knight to D5. Discovers an attack on this pawn while defending the bishop and attacking the rook. Very nice move. So rook to g3, dealing with all of those threats. Now rook a to e8, creating a new discovery threat. To move the bishop anywhere is to give check. So, for example, bishop d6 hitting the rook would be a nice move. If it was black's turn to move right here, that would win the rook for the bishop. So for that reason, white plays king to f1. And black plays bishop d6 anyway, and why not? Good move. Rook g4. And bishop e5 super attacking this pawn. He did have a nifty tactic that I, again, spotted because of this piece relationship. So there's the king, undefended, undefended, undefended. So what would be a nice active move that would unleash the attack of this rook against the king. Well, how about a move like pawn to f5? And white would not want to capture en passant because it leads to checkmate after rook takes f6 check. And then bishop f4 would have to be played. Not, not king g1 because that's checkmate instantly. Notice. Everything here is covered, so that's a back rank weakness. So, bam, checkmate. <clears throat> so he'd have to play bishop f4. Uh, not that it matters. Checkmate is in the shadows. Uh, knight to e3, check. It can't be taken because of the pin. Lovely. It does hit the rook here. So after king g1... Knight takes rook. Again, back rank weakness. Checkmate is being threatened. So, for example, he could not take this bishop because this is checkmate. So instead he'd have to play g3, give his king somewhere to run. But then we wouldn't give the check. There's no point in giving the check. We create what's known as a mating net. And so we're cutting off the king. And even if he threatens our rook, well, now we give check with the defense of our knight. King has to move again. And then we just start opening the line. Bishop takes bishop. Pawn takes bishop. Rook takes pawn. And how does he stop the checkmate? It's coming any second now. He might try rook a2. Uh, that only delays it because the rook's undefended. He's got nothing he can play. All he can do is delay. There's no stopping the checkmate except to delay it by giving away pieces and bada-bing, bada-boom. Back, 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 back. So, in any case, pawn to f4 would have been a real juicy um, move here. And granted, he doesn't have to take the pawn on passant. In fact, he should not take the pawn on passant. But he would have to move his rook somewhere that would be safe. Bishop e5. Again, it's not a losing move. It's a wonderful super attack. So we're not criticizing bishop e5 per se. We're just uh, looking at other options where... Um, there are some other de decisive plays on the board so that we can open our eyes to these ideas in the future and um, uh, have those in our mind. Well, bishop to d2, super defending. 
And pawn to f6, pawn to g6, pawn takes pawn, king to g1, pawn to g5, rook to a2, bishop c7, pawn to a4, and rook to e2. Very good to get the rooks on the 7th. When you can, this is also possibly eyeballing the idea of bishop to b6 check. Well, a takes b5, a takes b5, king f1, rook f e8, doubling the rooks, very good move, rook a6, a somewhat petty threat against this. <clears throat> Um, he played bishop f4. You can actually take this bishop. Note the peace relationship between the king and his rook. And that's what I call a pinwheel relationship. Here's the hub of the pinwheel. And boy, I'd love to play my knight there and fork the king and the rook. However, to do so would be to just end up trading my knight for his bishop. I play there, he takes, and then I take back. And that's just an equal trade. But if I take here, and you say, but it's still just an equal trade. Well, that is true. <laughs> but as far uh, advantaged as black is, uh, this let's just clear all the pieces off. There's check, Forkosaurus Rex, and when the king gets out of check, well, if he comes there, it's another check, so perhaps he'll come here. And note we have a back rank weakness again. So we're threatening mate. Well, it's not mate, is it, because the knight can block. Okay. But still, very um, aggressive, very active um, plan. Nothing wrong with what he played. Uh, in fact, it's saying, let's simplify. I want to trade down. He played rook takes c6, bishop takes, and now this was clearly a mistake because black has two attackers and white only has one defender. So he can overpower. Amazingly, he did not overpower. He went for more. He said, you know what? I could just overpower and go up a whole piece right here and right now. Um, you know, Bruce's only problem in this game is deciding on which winning move to play. There's so many winning moves. He's he's it's It's like a... A kid in a candy store, or a, or or a, a king's bishop at a buffet. <laughs> you know, oh boy, well, so many choices. It's so hard to decide which one. But yeah, just take that knight, and yeah, you're checkmating him in two moves. <clears throat> Interesting. He went for the kill though. Rook e1 check. King f2. Rook on e8 to e2 check, king g2, and now rook takes knight. As it turns out, that knight's still sitting there to be taken at any moment, so trying to flush out the king couldn't have been anything wrong with that. It's basically six of one and half a dozen of the other, isn't it? All right, rook to c5. Rook to d3 check. Very nice. A more powerful fork than white's because it comes with check. King to h2. And you might as well just pick off this pawn here. He played knight to f4, which is actually a delicious move in light of what white ended up playing. Um... Uh, 
but uh, this this is one instructive point here. Always assume your opponent is going to play the best move at his disposal. But uh, as it turns out, this turned out to be a delicious move by black because white, well, he just played right into black's hands. But you're probably just as well off just picking this off, win the pawn, defend the pawn, and then go with your attack from there. Well, he played knight f4, and rook takes b5. Well, after rook to e2, pinning this pawn, <laughs> what a glorious move. He played pawn to c5. He seems to be more worried about his pawn than he is about his king. And he didn't quite seem to understand the purpose of rook to e2. And uh, we're giving Professor Hedman a double exclamation point on his next move. Really, if white has any chance of surviving at all, um, and, and keeping this game going, he has to play rook g3. And you'll see why here in a moment. In fact, we'll pause and let the viewer find the winning move here in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You had your chance. After pawn to c4, the winning move is rook at h3 check double exclamation point. What a beautiful move. The pawn can't capture because it's pinned by the rook. The king can't capture because it's protected by the knight. Therefore, there's only one legal move, and that's king to g1. Double exclam, buddy. Look at that move. And now after king to g1, Rook to e1, check, leaving white again with only one legal move. And then, ladles and jelly spoons, bada bing, bada boom. A lovely checkmate from the knight. Attacking the king, defending the rook. The rook controls e2, as well as these squares. The other rook controls the third rank. And the king is checkmated. Give yourself a pat on the back. Bruce Hedman, what a glorious finish that was. Well done. All right, well, I hope you learned something from this video. And if you're interested in um, a video analysis being produced on one of your games or of one of the games of your favorite master or grandmaster, uh, be sure to send me an email. You'll find it in the description below. Or if you're interested in chess lessons, I've been working with Professor Hedman now for a couple of months, and he's definitely improving and so if you're interested in lessons, I can help you reach the next level in chess as well. So until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.